Hello. Welcome back. Okay, so today we will continue uh, our lecture on greedy algorithms. So let's uh, have a short review of the previous contents. We uh, introduced the activity selection problem. So, and we have also derived a uh, solution using an iterative algorithm, which basically it's based on the heuristic that we want to select uh, the compatible cap activity that has the earliest finish time, right? So that we have left as much resource as possible for the remaining activities, okay? And uh, the algorithm we used is like this on the slide. So we basically uh, go through uh, the activities sequentially. And we assume that all the activities, they are already sorted with respect to uh, the finish time, okay, in increasing order. So if we, when we, when we com, uh, consider the accurate, the, the time efficiency for the activity selection algorithm, we basically uh, more concrete, more precisely, we need to consider the uh, cost of first sorting all the activities, right, which is, uh, by uh, the time efficiency of n times logarithm of n. That is basically the optimal uh, uh, running time for, <clears throat> for uh, comparison-based sorting algorithms. Um, but if we, if we don't think that is a cost, so like if it's uh, taken into consideration or taken into Take, we just take it for granted, then the cost for the activity selection algorithm alone is just a linear time algorithm, okay? So uh, in the quiz question we have uh, provided in a question, there's a new uh, timeline uh, chart provided. And the question is asked whether uh, the new heuristic, like selecting the compatible activity that has the uh, latest starting time is also a valid heuristic or not. So that really uh, uh, is not the case because we, in order to have, in order to have that new heuristic to work, like if we select the activity, um, that has the latest starting time. And we need to basically select activities in a backward order. Like we, and also we need to have a new assumption that all the activities are sorted by their starting time, right? Instead of the finishing time. Um, if you haven't uh, done that, Quiz questions, I encourage you to do it uh, today. And uh, once the memories, uh, when the memories for the algorithms are still uh, fresh. Okay. So we will introduce uh, a different way of implementing the um, activity selection or activity selector procedure using a recursive style. And, but before that, we'll first look at how this problem, the activity selection problem is related to the uh, dynamic programming uh, approach or whether it can be solved by a dynamic programming uh, um, algorithm, okay? So one, Characteristics, the most important characteristic of a dynamic programming problem is that it has the optimal substructure, okay? Which means the optimal solution to the 
original problem consists of optimal solutions to the sub problems. So in the case of activity selecting, let's use the capital S I J to denote a subset of activities that starts after the AI finished. Okay, so the, sub, uh, the subscript here as IJ here, the I means this is a subset of activities and all the activities within this subset, they all start after AI finished and finished before AJ starts, okay? So the IJ basically indicates a, a, a range or a uh, segment along the timeline. It's only, it refers to those activities that occur within this short segment. After AI finished and uh, finished before AJ starts. Okay, so that's what the SIJ denotes. All right, so, and our goal is to find a maximum subset within this SIJ, okay? Because not all the activities within SIJ, they are compatible. We haven't do the selection yet. So we need to, our goal is to do the selection within this subset. And let's denote the optimal solution within this subset to be AJ, okay? So AJ is within SIJ, but all activities in AJ, they are compatible, mutually compatible, okay? So let's first lay out these uh, uh, terms and uh, notation settings, okay? All right, now let's consider the optimal solution to the original problem, to the biggest problem, okay? So imagine if, let's assume that the, the case activity, AK, is in the optimal solution, okay? If we assume AK is included in, in the final optimal solution, then we're basically left with, we are left with two sub-problems. The first sub problem is to look to the left of activity K, to the left side of AK. We want to find a maximum or optimal subsets within SIK. So SIK is uh, everything, all the activities before K starts, right? So let's assume that denotes this solution to this subproblem to be a i k. Okay, so the range is from i to k. So it's basically i is the left end and j is to the left end, and we assume that a k is included in the final solution. Then we basically need to solve the subproblems to the left, which is from i to k and subproblem to the right, which is K to J, right? So AKJ is the solution to the uh, right half subproblem, okay? So uh, everything within AKJ needs to start after AK finish, right? So this is uh, pretty clear, right? So we basically divide the problem into kind of two subproblems. So now we can use some um, mathematical uh, expressions to denote this relationship. So the solution to the subproblem SIJ is the union of three parts. First of all, the AK in the middle, because we assume that it is in the solution. And then the solution to the left subproblem and the solution to the right subproblem. So Looking at the size of the solutions, then we have these uh, uh, equations, okay? Because all the activities, they are mutually compatible with each other, okay? All right, so we basically define the, use a summation expression to define the kind of optimal substructure of the problem, okay? So we now can use, can think, the, think of this problem recursively. Right. We, in order to solve the original problem, we should divide it into two parts and then solve the 
two problems recursively. Okay. All right. Now let's back to the chart. So the solution that we are looking at is between the range of zero and uh, 16. We want to find all compatible, the optimal subsets of compatible uh, activities. Then we assume that, okay, so this is, a, we start from assumption. If we assume that A4 is in the final solution, okay, then that means within the final solution, we must include A4 and the solution to the right of A4 and uh, to the left of A4 before A4 starts. Okay, so this five here is the starting time of A4. So we need to look everything, look at everything before A4 starts and try to solve the, find the maximum subset within this left side. And then to the right of A4, which is after seven o'clock, after the ending time of A4, we need to also look at the right region and find the optimal solution to that right region, okay? So we basically can highlight, can visualize the problem into two parts, okay? If we assume A4 is selected, then we need to solve the same problem within the left range and within the right, or within the right range, which is in blue color, okay? We have two colors indicating it's two sub problems. Okay, so it's very typically, it's a very typical uh, uh, dynamic programming uh, approach that can be applied, okay? So if we solve the uh, two parts like individually, we will find that, okay, uh, A1 can be selected and A8 and A11 can be selected. And then we combine all these activities together as the solution to the original question, okay? So this is indeed an optimal solution. Um, what if we, our initial selection is A5, right? If we include A5, assume if A5 is in the final uh, solution here. Then we also look at the problem in the same way. We look to the left and look to the right, right? We need to look at look to the right before A5 starts and after A5 ends. Okay, so in this case, if we look at the left side of A5, there is actually no activity available, right? So all these activities they overlap with A5, and to the right of A5, there's only one compatible, which is A11. So unfortunately, in this case, if we assume that A5 is in the final solution then the solution is A5 and A11, only two events. So this is not, apparently this is not the optimal solution because we already know what the optimal solution is, okay? So that means our solution, the final solution depends on which activity we select at the beginning, okay? So theoretically, if we want to find the optimal solution, we need to go through all possible choices for the initial selection, right? Because A1 can be initially selected. Also A2, A3, A4, A5 to A11. We need to go through all these possible uh, initial choices, right? And then look at, the, look at both sides of the choice for all the initial uh, possible choices, okay? So, which reminds us of the typical uh, dynamic programming uh, approach, okay? So we can uh, formalize, formula, formalize the problem in a more uh, generalized way, okay? So we basically go, to, go through all possible values of the initial selection, AK, okay? And the final solution is the union between the AK, the solution to the left, the solution to the right, and we need to maximize this final solution by going through all possible ways, all possible choices of K, okay? So it is okay if we um, represent the problem in this, with this 
optimal substructure. Okay, and then we can rewrite it into a more uh, explicitly uh, expressed equations. Okay, so the solution to the subset Sij we denote it by Aij, right? So if it, it is the smallest case, so if Sij is empty, right? Then of course, there's nothing in the empty set. If it is not empty, then we need to go through all possible ways of the split, right? Ak is the, K indicates the point where we split the problem into two half, right? And if we tabularize the problem, like use uh, a 2D uh, array instead of the solution, instead of the function name solution, we can use a 2D array to indicate the solution to the problem between uh, I and J, right? Uh, after I starts before J, uh, after I finish before J starts. So we can use a 2D array to, in, to store the problem, to store the solution to the problem. So we, it's, a, it's a basically a very typical uh, dynamic programming approach. Okay, we can use tabular methods, uh, which is uh, kind of similar to the, um, um, to the matrix chain, matrix chain multiplication problem. We use a draw, draw a uh, 2D arrays, a uh, 2D array like matrix and then solve the problems using this way. Uh, we can come up with uh, uh, bottom up or top down uh, implementations for the problem. Okay. Um, but one uh, specialty here about the problem is that this is using a dynamic programming approach is correct, but it is an overkill, okay? Because we, uh, um, the specialty of the time activity selection is that if we use a simple heuristics like what we used before, like the selecting the activities uh, that has the earliest uh, starting time, uh, earliest uh, finishing time is sufficient to um, give us, to lead us to the optimal, to lead us to the op global optimal solution. And we don't actually need to exhaustively explore the sub problem space like this maximize operation indicates, okay? We don't need to like uh, use the exhaustive search over the sub space, over the sub problem space. And that is determined by the uh, property of the problem. So it's about uh, searching linearly like, like linear search over a contiguous uh, segment of time. And the simple heuristic is enough to ensure us the, the optimal solution. So we don't actually need dynamic programming. And it's uh, in theory, dynamic programming should cost us more running time because it's going to search all the possible subspaces, all the sub-problem sub, sub Sub problems. Okay. So now let's uh, look at a recursive algorithm. Okay. So uh, this algorithm is not based on the sub, uh, the optimal substructure, but this is based on the greedy, uh, greedy thoughts. Like we just need to uh, select the activity that has the earliest uh, finishing time. Okay. So if you look at the um, procedure, the S and F, these are just two areas. It, store, it stores the, they store the start, starting time and the finishing time. So the K and Ns, they are integer numbers. So what they mean is that the procedure wants to find the maximum subsets after AK finished and before AN starts. So the input is K, 
and the search will start from k plus one. Okay, so that means we only start from the right of activity k. We don't need to look back before a k starts. Okay, we just look to the right and we use a while loop to find the possible, the optimal candidate i. Okay, so as long as the starting time of activity i is earlier than the finish time of k, which means as uh, the i is not compatible with k, then we will further increment i. Then we will stop until either we hit n or the si, the i is greater than k, okay? So if i is a valid value, then we will return the union between activity ai and a recursive call this time on the activity i because i is included into the solution and now the i should be the new start point of the search okay so within this recursive call the search will start to the right of i and we don't need to look to the left of i because that part is already handled within this first call, okay? And if the i is out of boundary, like is beyond the n, is n plus, is already, that means we don't have the a valid activity selected, then we'll simply return uh, empty set, okay? So this is a, uh, a uh, recursive uh, solution that kind of reflects the optimal substructure of the problem. But the difference from a dynamic programming approach is that we don't need to look back into history by whether we made the optimal solution in the past, right? We just look to the future. We just look to the, uh, before the current, before the uh, current activity ends, we just to the right of it, okay? So, in order to solve the original problem, we just give the input like n and zero and n, then we can solve the entire problem. Okay, then let's again use some example uh, to see how the algorithm works. Okay, it's actually quite similar uh, to the, to the non-recursive, to the iterative solution. Okay, so our call is on, the initial call is between zero and 11. Okay, we, we want to find the optimal sub, uh, subset within this range. Okay, and the I, the search will start from one, zero plus one is one, okay? And then we will use the while loop to do the search. Okay, so the first, uh, satisfied i is one, right? And then we will recursively call the function on s and one, 11, between one, uh, between one and 11. So this time the i will start from two. That means we, we start searching to the right of uh, a one, okay? Then we'll start from A2, but A2 is not cap compatible, right? A3 is not compatible, and then A4. So this time we will hit A4 and A4 is selected. So then the next search will start from four to 11, right? And the starting point is four plus one, right? Is from activity five and we don't need to go back. We don't need to go back that way because that is already done. We just need to go forward, okay? Uh, we are starting from zero here. Our starting point is zero here. Oh, uh, I think your question is, is why do we start your, your question is your question regarding to this part, like why I start from zero? Yeah, because activity A zero is not defined. 
the activity is start, start from A1. That is uh, by the nature of the problem, by the definition. So yeah, the, the starting point zero here is just, uh, is just to initiate, is just to like jumpstart the, the solution. Okay, then A4 is selected. Then we will select A8, okay? And we do the same thing. We search the right half of the problem, okay? Until we hit the last problem, okay? So this also leads to, uh, leads to the optimal solution, just like the iterative uh, algorithm, okay? But uh, personally, I think this uh, um, recursive um, problem, it's kind of more reflect the optimal substructure of the problem. And uh, the iterative in, in, uh, implementation is more kind of a uh, purely greedy strategy based. Okay. Although this one is also a greedy strategy based because it didn't look at the left side. It just ignored the left side. A9. So the A9 shouldn't be selected because uh, the finishing time of A9 is 12. Okay, so the assumption doesn't change. We are still assume that all the activities, they are uh, sorted with increasing order uh, of the finishing time. So A8 will be first met before A9, although they are uh, starting time or the other same. Okay, so let's assume this extreme case, like if A1 starts at 11, okay? And that shouldn't change the order of the uh, 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 activities because A11 is 16 here, right? And in our selection, if, uh, if we select A9 instead of A8, right, at this step, then after A9 is selected, then we basically need to look at the right side of A9 and select the compatible activities. But since A11 overlaps with A9, then A11 would not be included in the solution. So if we select A9 at this step, then we will end up with A1, A4, and A9, which is only three activities. So what if we select A8, then A8 doesn't overlap with the A11 here because A8 ends earlier, right? Then if we select A8, then A11 would be uh, included, okay? So in this case, we will have four selections. We'll have four activities selected. Okay. Officer, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, but you know, as of now, A11 year does not start from 11, right? Yeah. Uh, so we can select, uh, this is not an optimal solution to select using recursive activity selector. Um, what do you mean by not a optimal solution? So, so uh, if A9, if a9 was selected after A4 mm -hmm. and A11 after that, that would be a optimal solution. <clears throat> so I, I think I guess what you mean is that A9 lasts longer than A8. Yeah. Right, so uh, uh, from that perspective, A9 is a better choice, okay? So that is a different problem now. 
And the original prob the problem that we are talking about at this point is that we only care about the number of activities, but we don't count the length of activities. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, it'll be, it's a good question though. Like if uh, the, the, we, we charge people by how much time they rent the hall, then we, of course we want the total length of the activities to be as long as possible. Like we want the hall to be occupied as much as possible, right? Then things are more, uh, I would say easier, right? So if you look at the activity A10, right? It lasts from 14 to uh, 2 o'clock to 14 o'clock. It's already 12 hours occupied, okay? So that is a uh, very uh, uh, different problem as compared to the, uh, the current one that we are talking about. If we, uh, if we only care about the number of activities, then uh, it can be solved by this greedy search. But uh, in terms of other conditions like the length of the activity, then uh, it's a bit more different. Okay. So now let's go on to the next section. So we will see another applications of the um, greedy search or greedy strategy in uh, uh, designing algorithms, okay? So this is a, call, a problem called Huffman codes, okay? And uh, you may have already heard of it or learned about it. Uh, it's uh, first uh, proposed as a way to encode uh, data being transmitted in, in communication theories, in information theories. So it's a, a effective comparison, uh, compression uh, algorithm, okay? So in this case, we look at a, a, a simplified version of it. So we are trying to uh, compress a sequence of uh, characters, okay? So our task here is to uh, encode each character into a binary code, like into a binary number. For example, um, and, all, and this, this method will use a table, a frequency table, like a table that counts uh, how the frequencies for each character so that we can uh, represent or encode each character in an optimal way, okay? So now let's look at the data. It looks like this. We have uh, six characters uh, in this uh, toy data set. And we have the frequencies for each uh, characters listed here. So A is the most uh, frequent, uh, frequent letter. It appears 45,000 times and so on for all the other uh, letters. Okay, so now here, we notice that there are two ways of doing the encoding. The first way is called fixed length code. The last one is variable length code, okay? The difference as the name indicates is that for fixed code, length code, for all the characters, we assign them the fixed number of digits to encode them, right? They all have been assigned with three digits. And for the variable lens code, the lens varies with frequencies, okay? So F is the least frequent uh, character. So it will be, it is assigned with four digits. And A is the most frequent uh, letter. So it's assigned with just one digit. So this is a more, reasonable or scientific way of doing things because if you want to assign, if we tend to send the letter A more frequently, then of course you want to save uh, time, save energy by sending just a fewer uh, number of digits or fewer number of codes, okay? So if we compute the total number of bits and we assume that one code should be uh, should consume us one bit of information, okay? 
we want we can calculate the number of bits for the fixed length code by do this simple summation and then uh, multiplication, right? We have 50, 45 plus 13 plus 12, blah, blah. It's a summation of the frequencies and then times three, then it will cost us 300K uh, bits information or um, to consume that, uh, consume us that much uh, amount of energy to, to, to encode the whole uh, vocabulary, right? Then if we look at the variable length, the total number of bits for A is 45 times one because it's just a zero, it's just one bit. And for B, it's three bits. So it's 13 times three. And for C, it's also 12 uh, times three. And for the least, uh, for the least uh, frequent two characters, it's four bits. So in calculating the frequency, the total number of bits in this way, it will give us 224,000 bits, which is significantly smaller than the fixed length code. So it indicates that, okay, so the variable length uh, code is a better way, right? Saves uh, time, saves, uh, memory saves energy, right? So how do we uh, come up with an optimal way to uh, encode all the characters according to their frequency? So this is the task that Huffman code is going to solve, okay? And let's first look at some uh, technical point, some technicality. So first we need to consider the prefix code. So what is a prefix code? In a prefix code as highlighted by the third, the row here, okay? We can notice that a prefix code, in a prefix code, no code is a prefix of some other code. Like the zero, is never the prefix of 101, 100, or 10. So it never appears here. So, and 101, it also never appeared as prefix in other places. Okay. So the advantage of this is that we have few less ambiguity. So it allows for unambiguous decoding, okay? So the only way to, in this is an example, the only way to decode the sequence, if we got a sequence, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1. If we look at the table, then when we got a zero, we know that it must be A, right? And a zero, it also must be A. And then we have one, zero, one. Then we know it's B. And one, one, zero, one. Okay, it's E. Okay. So there's no other ways. There's no ambiguity in the data. And if we use a counter example as using the noun prefix code, say we've got zero here, then it could be A, two A's, or it could be C. So the decoding is not unique, which is give us trouble, right? We want to encode and decode uh, the, the characters in a consistent and uh, in a unique way. Okay, so it's, uh, that's some, um, um, more technicality, okay? So how do we achieve the goals? We will need to use some data structure. And in this case, we use a, a binary, tree, binary tree representation of the data, okay? So the, it, the, the tree structure, the binary tree structure allows us to uh, 
uh, have a representation for a prefix code. Okay, so the leaves in the tree. Okay, so leaf nodes are those nodes that don't have children nodes. The so leaves are characters, and the code for a character is the path from the root. Root is on top of the tree. Is the topmost right? The top, top the, the root node. And the path from the root to the leaf character is the code to that character, okay? So for example, I'm showing a tree to the left of the table, right? And the leaf nodes, they are in the boxes. So this, this leaf node is A, right? And the path from the root, okay? So this 100 node is the root. From the root to A is zero. So that is exactly the code for A. And let's see where B is. Okay, so B is here. And the path from the root to B is one, zero, one, right? So that's the code for B. And for C, it's one, zero, zero. And that is a code for C, okay? So a binary tree provides a very convenient uh, way to represent the prefix code, okay? So we'll further look at how we uh, construct this uh, binary tree, okay? And a binary tree has two paths, two branches. The zero is on the left. It means go to the left child and one means go to the right child, okay? So all these paths are uh, organized in the same way, zero on the left and one on the right, okay? So the binary tree should be a full tree, okay? That means every non-leaf node has two children. There shouldn't be any non-leaf node that has just one child, okay? And the tree, if we compare it with a fixed length code tree, then a fixed length code tree is not a um, full tree, right? So in this case, as a comparison, the fixed length tree is like this. And there are some uh, parts that are empty that don't, this node doesn't have a right child. But if you look at all the uh, non-leaf child here, they all have two children nodes, okay? So that is a bit uh, uh, difference between the, again, between the uh, variable length code and the fixed length code, okay? So before we start building a binary tree, let's look at some properties of it, okay? And now let's use the capital C to denote the alphabets from which the characters are drawn, okay? Then the, the C, the size of the alphabet, it's a set, right? The, 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 the size of the alphabet defines how many leaf nodes we will have in the tree, okay? And for that many leaf nodes, for C leaf nodes, that would be C minus one internal nodes, okay? So in the case here, we have leaf nodes from A to D, that is, that is six uh, leaf nodes and the internal nodes is six minus one, okay? So that is the property of a full binary tree. So now let's formally, finally, let's look at the way to build the optimal prefix tree, okay? And the intuition is also very simple. Remember, we want the uh, character that has the lowest frequency or have low, relatively low frequencies to be assigned with longer codes because the longer codes are kind of um, more costly, right? We don't want to use longer code that often. So for more often, uh, more frequent characters, we can use uh, shorter code. We should use shorter code because they are going to be used more often, okay? So that means the letters with lower frequencies should have longer paths. And longer paths means that they are, 
those characters, those leaf nodes, they are farther apart from the roots. They should be at the bottom of the tree. Okay, so if we are going to build up the tree from a bottom up style, then which characters we need to choose first? If we build the bottom rows first, I guess the answer is also correct, is obvious, right? We need to choose the most, the least frequent characters to, uh, to be the leaf nodes in the bottom of the tree. Okay, so in this case, the F and E, the character F and E, they are at the bottom of the tree, right? So we should first select the letters of the lowest frequency first, right? Okay, so now you may notice that the nodes in the tree, they are associated with the number. The number is the, their frequency in the original table, okay? So we're gonna define the node a little bit. So in the tr binary tree, the Z node has two properties. So the Z left points to the left child X and the Z right, Z dot right points to the right child. So we can create a tree structure by basically assigning X to Z dot left and the Y to Z dot right. So that will combine the three objects, the combine the three uh, uh, nodes together to form a tree structure, okay? And also, if we left, uh, if we let the left property of X to be now, and the right property, uh, and the right property of X also to be now. Okay, so here is a typo. What I mean is X. Okay, so X the right is also now. Then X is a leaf node because it doesn't have any uh, children node. All right, and then. Another property for a node is the frequency attributes. So the Z dot frequent is the records the uh, stores the frequency of the that character. Okay. All right. Now let's look at the Huffman code algorithm. Okay. Uh, it's quite a, a neat uh, algorithm, and we need to utilize some data sets. Okay, so first of all, the C is a set of N characters, okay? And N in the size of C. So we will initialize a minimal priority Q. So this Q is a minimal priority Q with all letters. And we will initialize the letters, uh, initialize the Q with the, with the uh, alphabet or with the vocabulary C. Then also each character has a attribute called C dot frequent, okay? And then we use the minimum priority Q data structure to help us uh, do the encoding, okay? So we will go through, uh, use a for loop to uh, go through the alphabets, okay? And let's mention that, let me mention a mini, uh, the minimal priority queue a little bit. So this is a data structure that is similar to a queue, okay? So a queue is a data set that lets the elements first get in to get served first, okay? So along with queue, we would have priority queue. So the priority queue uh, the elements in a priority queue has a priority score with it. So the elements that has the highest score, priority score will get served first. So on top of that, the minimal priority queue is a queue in which all the elements has some uh, priority scores, right? But has some scores, but the element with the minimal value has the highest uh, priority, okay? So we can think of it as a kind of a minimal, we can implement it with a, a minimal heap, okay? Minimal heap is something we mentioned when we talk about the heap sorts, but in heap sorts, it's the maximum heap that we use, but the minimal heap also is kind of similar. The It's also a tree-like structure, but the parents should always be, have smaller values than the children node. That is the 
property for minimal priority queue. Okay. So anyway, we will implement, uh, we'll utilize some data sets, uh, data structure called uh, minimal priority queue. So what this algorithm does is to uh, continually, continuously extract the minimal elements from Q, right? So this extract mean function will pop out the smallest element in Q, okay? So within each iteration of the for loop, it will first allocate a new node and then extract X one element and make it the left node of the new node and then extract one more and makes that Y node the right node of Z. Okay, and then we will recompute the frequency of Z by summing up the frequencies for X and Y, okay? And then we will insert the new node Z back to the minimal Q, okay? So that is a kind of a uh, cycles, right? We extract two out and then we combine the two, make a tree structure by combining these two and make a new root node and then insert that root node back to the tree, back to the queue, okay? And then we'll let the cycle go goes on, okay? Until we uh, have only one uh, element in the queue and then we will finally return that only one left in the queue, okay? So let's see why this algorithm should work uh, to generate the Huffman, uh, so generate the binary tree for Huffman code. Okay, so use the same example in the data. We will initialize the queue this way, right? We will basically organize the way that it looks so that it's, it's, it's kind of a, a shows the minimal priority uh, property. Okay, so the first iteration will extract the node F out, okay? And the second one being extracted is the node E, okay? And then we will create a new node Z and F is its left child and the E is its right child. And the frequency property for Z is five plus nine, which is 14, okay? So that means we created something new, okay? And remember, we need to insert and also the path comes along with zero and one. That's the, how we memorize the, the, memorize the encodings. So we will need to insert this new node Z back to Q, okay? And the total frequency is 14 here. So it will appear in the proper place that's after 13 and before 16, okay? So that's where it's positioned is in the minimal priority queue, okay? Now let's have the cycle carry on, right? We will uh, extract C, right? And then B, okay? And create something combined. C and B combined will result in this new tree structure, right? And the frequency is 12 plus 13, which is 25, and it will get inserted back, okay? Also into some position. All right, so next it's kind of interesting because we need to pop out the next row node and it is the new node that we created in the first round, right? It has the, it has the property uh, total frequency 14, okay? And next the node D, okay? So now we are gonna create some more something more hierarchical, like something new node like this, because the orange one has the frequency 14. So it is on the left side <clears throat> and then D is on the right side. And they have the root node that has the summation of the frequency 14 plus 16, which is 30, okay? So this new node, very hierarchical one is also inserted back, okay? We have uh, fewer and fewer nodes left. All right, so the next step is also 
kind of the same thing we want to do. We insert, we will pop out this node and also pop out this node and combine them into a very high tree-like structure. Okay, we merge them into, into a new node and pay attention to the node here, 55. It's the summation of 25 and 30. So this new node will be inserted back to Q. So now we have only two nodes together left. And we just need to merge them into one and insert back, which has 100 as the total frequency. And now we're done because there's only one element in the queue and we just need to pop it out and return the results, right? So looking at the pass, we can observe a binary, a final binary tree for the optimal prefix code, okay? If we examine the results, it's exactly what we need, okay? We just, uh, if you look at E, it's Z1, 1, 0, 1. And for F, it's 1, 1, 0, 0, okay? So um, that's uh, all we need to, uh, need to, all we need uh, eventually after we have built the binary tree, okay? So about the correctness of the algorithm, uh, it's not required here. And if you are interested, you can go to the go to the textbook to see uh, a very uh, detailed proof. Okay, but what I want to mention here is the greedy choice that the algorithm is making at each step. Okay, so the total cost of the bits, in terms of bits, number of bits to encode a file, is the frequency of A times the depth of A, okay? So the depth is the code length, which is one here, right? And the depth of B, depth of C times the frequencies and the sum up all the products. So that's the uh, total cost. But uh, by constructing the tree from a bottom up style, the first chosen nodes always have the larger depths, okay? So choosing the two nodes with the lowest frequencies will minimize the cost of the current step, okay? But by the time we are minimizing the current step, we don't know whether it will lead to the final globally optimized cost, right? If we choose the lowest two properties, lowest to uh, the two nodes with the lowest frequencies, we don't know whether this will lead to the optimal global choice, but we just think it is currently the best choice. So this is where the greedy choice happens, okay? So that's why the textbook in this uh, list in the textbook, and also uh, I think it makes sense to uh, include the Huffman code as a greedy algorithm. Okay, because it's definitely some greedy choice uh, involved here. All right, then let's spend a little time on the running time, okay? So the one for loop, right? We have a for loop. It's kind of reminds of us linear time uh, efficiency, right? But we also need to, uh, Notice that there pops out and insert elements within each iteration. So what if we um, implemented the minimal priority queue with a minimal heap data structure? Then all these heap operations will take the logarithm of n time, okay? So the total running time should be n times the logarithm of n because all these logarithm operations happened within a linear for loop uh, iterations, okay? So it's quite, uh, I would say a quite efficient algorithm because it's just a kind of a sorting algorithm, right? And that's basically the Huffman uh, code uh, algorithms, okay? So I think I will end here and in the next lecture, we're gonna wrap up the greedy algorithms chapter, and then we'll see some 
uh, the properties of greedy algorithms, and then we will uh, use knapsack uh, problem as our final uh, examinations, as our final, not examination, but as the final lecture content examples. Okay, And we'll see some more interesting connections between greedy algorithm and the dynamic program. And that's uh, the course for today. If you have questions, can let me know. Uh, midterm by our schedule, if you look at the syllabus, it, it is the uh, early November, November 2nd or 3rd. Let me check my calendar. It should be November the 3rd. Yes, November the 3rd. So I will do another uh, review lecture in the next uh, week.